because I was just copied into some conversations after the last Seriously Strange weekend um, yeah. where where some of the feedback was in two words that um, some members would like, in inverted commas, more ufology. Um, so the first thing I'd say is nothing to do with the facts of the Roswell case. It's quite simple. I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that I saw Janet Wimslow posting earlier today to say, well, the case has been done to death. So is there anything new to say about it? Good point. And at the same time, I'm mindful that some people in ASAP were interested in, as I said, in inverted commas, more ufology, quite literally that almost like non-specific. Let's just have more about UFOs. So the first most useful thing that ASAP generally might get from the talk tonight is in the chat. I have no idea. I mean, I, I know that one or two people were interested in more about UFOs. I have no idea of the level of knowledge. I know from conversations I've had with people at conference and at events and stuff like that, that um, in some cases, people are aware of UFO cases, but that's it. In other cases, they know quite a lot and they don't talk about it. And when I, I haven't I haven't been in the ass up that long, Christian, have I? So, I mean, the, the point I would make is that when I first joined, I was very, very conscious of the fact that my main interest ufos was rob's area and i wasn't about to move in on that because it was what he did no i think i think it's a really excellent idea to cover these cases and especially mm. the massively contested history right of somewhere like roswell so let's, it's a narrative isn't it it's chronology yeah. it's more than just one instant it's a let's, whole let's, story let's, let's to cover that and then that that way we don't accidentally preempt anything with a random discussion beforehand but the point sure, sure. is if you like if you if the chat at the end of this is the you know with the best will in the world i was teaching people to suck eggs for an hour then that's a useful learning thing for for us up and we can we can be a lot more specific um secondly this is a kind of it's an overview of the whole case so it, it's as simple as that it's um it's covering the kind of history of it so i'm not i'm not taking a particular line other than i'm trying to steer a middle course throughout most of the whole thing that we're we're going to cover then towards the end i mean the obvious question well what the hell do you think neil might get asked i'll, I'll let you know towards the end of it but, 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 but if this is number one so anyway you must have a top 10 you must have a top 10 come on there must be others you care about as well what? that was my joke actually which you interrupted which was that we have a top 10 here we have a chart and this is the undi undisputed number one as no, you no, again let, let's be clear about this it's the undisputed no, well, well we'll come on to this in a minute but um when i originally pitched the talk i put a question mark at the end of it you right. it's great to hit question mark which i think is a i think that's a really good point to to begin on basically roswell so as you can see from here the the words on the slide it's the biggest undisputably the best questionably okay um it is without doubt ufology's best known and most celebrated case so if if you're unfamiliar with ufology this is the one that more more people have spoken about at conferences more people have written about it's produced more books more documentaries specific to the case more appearances in general documentaries it is monstrous in terms of of ufology and that's central to its identity within ufology now so for example 75 years on from the incidents that provided us with the Roswell case, um, there were two new documentary series, one of which ironically was called um, The Final Verdict. And I'll, I'll discuss that much later in the proceedings, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you know now what I think about that, which is that no, there is no one documentary that's ever going to be the final verdict because a little bit like the death of Marilyn Monroe or something mm -hmm. like that, we're missing key evidence we may well be missing key evidence forever uh, and in those cases it's largely it's it's down to a lot of facts and individual interpretations and if you were just going to be an absolute cynic about it one of the things that roswell the roswell case in general has told us 
already is that there is no final verdict because it for as long as it keeps on giving and for as long as it keeps on providing material for people somebody with a relatively new angle can probably make a bit more money out of it so in in the same way that we're unlikely in our in the foreseeable future to run out of books documentaries or anything else about elvis uh roswell is that animal so the question of whether it's too big to fail i would argue the case is almost too big that it it's made itself so big that it can't it will not cease to be interesting and whilst for a lot of people there are very definite ideas and some people would claim that the evidence one way or the other is so conclusive that they don't have much truck with the other side of the argument the, the gist of it is roswell keeps feeding the skeptics and the believers to such an extent that it's at the moment it is too big to fail uh, it's too big to fail because somebody somewhere at this very moment will be working on a book a documentary or some such thing and roswell is a brand effectively right uh I'll, I'll give it a bit of the danny robbins treatment on this so we will keep visiting team skeptic and team believer as we go through this this is team skeptic uh he's no longer with us but carl flock is arguably the main man of team skeptic if i read that over to you he's basically this is his view on roswell having investigated it in a lot of detail simply shovel everything that seemed to support their view into the box marked evidence and say see look at all this stuff we must be right never mind the contradictions never mind the lack of independent supporting fact never mind the blatant absurdities now that is a quote from a book called inconvenient facts and the will to Be roswell inconvenient facts and the will to believe uh we'll discuss the context of how that book came to exist much later in the proceedings but I'll make a point at this juncture about Team Skeptic. One of the main Team Skeptic arguments about Roswell is quite simple. It's not down to an individual fact. It's down to something that keeps happening in the Roswell case. Specifically, it's down to the way that the case behaves as Carl Flock has just described it there, right? That evidence is shoveled into a particular area. And when there are contradictions or things undermine it they just tend to get ignored um now this is the context here is that carl flock when he did it the book on roswell roswell inconvenient facts he was actually being paid by the fund for ufo research you can google this and it existed towards the end of the last century uh the fund for ufo research spent seven hundred thousand dollars investigating a bunch of ufo cases and its remit was really simple it was gather as much money as you possibly can to put significant critical investigations together on the best UFO cases, the purpose of which would be to provide evidence to the very people that we think should be taking these seriously, i.e. academic specialists in science and the rest of it. The Fund for UFO Research never spent more money or more time than it did on any one case other than Roswell. Carl Flock managed most of that. Carl Flock came back with the conclusion that the case was effectively that the case was nothing that it was built on it was built on lies it was built on uh well blatant misunderstandings of information and in certain cases key evidence that everybody believed existed proved not to exist and carl flock's take on that was he's not he's not proving a negative there so much as basically just chasing down leads and coming up with nothing i he 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 personally went looking for certain key people certain key pe pieces of evidence and didn't find them team believer it's a complete opposite the team believer response to that is quite simply that the stuff that would prove it has been covered up for years and arguably again um you could you could take issue with this but arguably the a player in the team believer operation over the years died in 2019 uh stanton friedman and this is Stan Freeman talking about, well, Roswell, but but the whole cover up thing. You know, frankly, I'm sick and tired of the US Air Force lying to the public, the press and members of Congress about UFOs. Now, Stan Freeman was a massive figure in ufology. So my apologies to anybody who knows the ufology backwards because I'm not telling them anything new. But um, just not long before the lockdown, I was at a UFO conference in Pontefract run by 
uh, how to limit magazine phil mantle who has flying disc press which if you're unfamiliar with flying disc press google it afterwards um it's a i mean whatever you think of their works you'd probably want to support it it's a it's a british operation um run by a guy called philip mantle who's been a lifelong ufologist um and it's devoted entirely to publishing books on ufos simple as uh, they've recently done a book called Europe's Roswell, which is about an, uh, a case, a 40 year old case, a Welsh case, basically, which is largely unknown, uh, done, uh, written by a guy called Mark Ollie, which I read. I don't know what to make of it, but it's one of the more interesting UFO books I've read in, re in the recent past. Uh, and at the, the Pontefract UFO conference, even she's like Yorkshire in, you know, a long, long way from the United States. They had a moment of silence and a reverent interlude in memory of Stan Freeman. God bless Stan Stanton Friedman. He died of a heart attack in an airport uh, on his way home from a speaking gig. He was speaking and doing perform presentations, doing TV presentations on UFOs to the end of his life and just do the maths on his age. So he was 85, uh, still out there doing it. So he not only did he believe he 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 quite literally walked the walk and um like i say he died in transit basically on his way home from a um, speaking in toronto but he epitomizes the team believer take on roswell which is quite simple there is a lot of circumstantial evidence the circumstantial evidence leads to a conclusion about a cover up the cover up, if you like, is proven by the regular denials and regular failures of public bodies to come up with the actual evidence. Therefore, this is a this is an item of faith as well. So Simple. The truth, it isn't there. Therefore, they ain't got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that was a real person and not a, like a not a spirit. Is anybody there? I'm going to go on. I, I assume I assume that some random was just just muted. I'll I'll be taking questions at the end. Don't worry. And I, I, if I I only caught the end of that, if the gist of that was they can't produce the evidence if it doesn't exist in the first place, I think that point will be addressed as we go through the case. Okay. So this is where we are basically. Just just a, a brief overview. What do we know? Well, the big organisations on Earth, Mufon, are the most powerful in terms of membership and probably media presence ufo organization on earth at the moment um they they and one or two organizations like them believe very much in the eth the extraterrestrial hypothesis hypothesis i.e it is an item of faith amongst organizations like that that um what's behind the bulk of ufo sightings and the consistencies in them is an alien presence on the earth which is also known to governments and covered up right interesting thing so roswell is literally the sergeant pepper of the citizen cane of ufology that's what i'm saying so when you know when i say to christian chill out i'll cover that yeah absolutely it, 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 if you're thinking about a top 10 it's up there i.e it's so big it's almost its presence alone is enough to define it these days you i once saw sergeant pepper I, I got a book on like you know the most cult out the most underrated albums the most cultish albums you can ever discover and along with bim sherman's reggae album with no drum kit on it and stuff like that the author th thought to put sergeant pepper in there as in, as in arguing it's misunderstood um you know it's almost like roswell has got that it's got it's got every dimension up to and including the argument that it's it, that it's despite being in plain sight it's widely misunderstood it is all things to all people and ironically the next two bullet points there kind of make the point for me really that um team skeptic and team believer and the wikipedia and all the sort of general public sources to a large extent, draw on the same evidence. It's not an argument about what evidence is out there, and it's not largely an argument about dates and times and names. Um, it's an argument about interpretation. Now, granted, there's lots of doubt about the dates and times and names, which I'm going to get to in a, in a minute, but um, that's where we are, okay? So let's just do a bit of um kind of history of it. Uh, the building that you're looking at on the right is the in inverted commas, the Brazel Ranch. Uh, it, it was 
W. W. Mac Brazel, who you're looking at on the left, was the first person who uh, discovered wreckage. So there's a lot of doubt and a lot of argument about things to do with the Roswell case. One thing that is in no doubt and no argument is that the first witness, the first person to witness anything was a rancher called Mac Brazel. He was effectively a tenant farmer, as we'd understand it in the UK, on a, um, on the Foster Ranch, which is not in Roswell. It's near a Corona in New Mexico. That's the ranch house in which he was living at the time. And he was just going about his duties and he found a load of debris out on the ground. Uh, the date is somewhat in doubt. And the best guess, if you look at the original case reports and stuff like that, the, the eyewitness reports from before the case got just absolutely overblown, is that he discovered the debris on or around the 14th of June, 1947. Now, this matters actually quite a lot because the first book written about the case, which we'll have a look at in a minute, which is the, uh, the Roswell incident by Bill Moore and Charles Burlitt, Sites supporting evidence of a UFO that was spotted on the 2nd of July. Mac Brazel gathered the debris up, but he didn't do anything with it until after he'd heard about the flying saucer craze. And he took it into um, Sheriff George Wilcox, who was his local county sheriff uh, in Corona, and took it there. And cutting a very long story short, George Wilcox then contacted the army air base so again let's get this out in the open it's a complicated thing the american air force are the people accused of the cover-up there was not an american air force uh, at the beginning of july 1947 it was the usaf the united states army air force so despite the fact that america had an air force and had dropped nuclear bombs by this point um the Air Force was in the process of becoming independent. So actually, it was still technically speaking, in terms of management, it was a branch of the army. Events moved forward very, very quickly indeed. Uh, so once the sheriff had contacted the airbase, the airbase took an interest and very quickly dispatched people to go and pick up some of the debris. Um, so Mac Brazel, who knew where the site of the wreckage was, had only gathered about a cigar box full, basically, not a huge amount of debris. He'd taken enough in to show the sheriff. He'd indicated in doing this that there was a lot more debris out there that was to be discovered if people wanted it. And the Air Force, the US Army Air Force, dispatched a recovery team very, very quickly. But it was it, it was done on a kind of you know, pretty low key basis. They knew they were going to get something. They didn't know what. Uh, so the individuals concerned, depending on which book you read, they're described in different ways. There is absolutely no doubt that the guy in the bottom right hand corner holding the bit of balloon debris, Jesse Marcel, was part of the recovery team. Uh, Mac Brazel was part of the recovery team, the rancher, actually went out and picked up debris because he had to show everybody where it was. Having shown the Air Force personnel where this debris was, he helped them to recover it. Um, there is a reference to someone in civilian clothes helping out, i.e. somebody else. Uh, Sheridan Cabot, who was a counterintelligence officer on the base. So just to put this into context, Major Jesse Marcel and Major Sheridan Cabot were both part of the recovery team. They had equal military rank, but completely different roles. Jesse Marcel was an intelligence officer. Sheridan Cavett was a counter intelligence officer. Uh, another individual was involved as well, Bill Rickett, but it's debate. You'll find different case, different reports debate in what role he actually played in the recovery. Um, this will become significant later on because Carl Flock, who I quoted earlier on, who's basically the A player, the ringer on Team Skeptic. When he went and did his investigation around 50 years after the event, um, Mac Brazel and Jesse Marcel were both dead. Sheridan Cavett was available to him. And if you go online now, you can find Sheridan Cavett's testimony, basically, um, where he indicates that what was picked up was nothing of any particular surprise or significance. It looked like weather balloon debris to him. That said, the case, and Christian's absolutely right, there is a time before Roswell, there's a time when it was 
conspicuous by its absence, which I'll get to in a minute. But central to the Roswell case and central to everything that's believed these days is the press release that was issued on the 8th of July, 1947, um, issued by Walter Hort at the Roswell Army Air Force Base. And he indicated, as it says there, that they captured a flying saucer. The opening words of the press release were the many rumours about the flying disc. So um, the airbase announced they'd captured a flying disc. And it was briefly news in and around Roswell. And, you know, it, it made local news bulletins and national news bulletins briefly on the radio. Um, in fact, one of the people who's quoted in before the case took on a humongous life of its own, um, one of the people who was quoted as a kind of witness was um, an airman who was driving from coast to coast in the United States at the time that this went on and heard the news reports a couple of times on the radio and was really intrigued. Um, the point being, he would then talk about it quite openly later on in his life. And he was quite well known in his country because the guy in question was Huey Green, who was a, at that point a Canadian pilot, but went on to be the, the host of Opportunity Knox in the UK. So random people the whole time would say that they'd heard this story. So it didn't it didn't quite cease to exist. It just exploded, went quiet for a long, long time and then came back with a vengeance in the in the very late 1970s. So these are the key people in, in the initial phase of it. Without any one of these three people, the case wouldn't be what it is today. Roger Ramey on the left was um, a general, an, an, basically an army rank, but obviously he was looking after the, uh, the Army Air Force at the time. So his responsibility was the Air Force, but he was an army rank because they hadn't yet separated out the Air Force. Um, his significance in it is this. He was the person who, once the debris had been found, he was the person who insisted that the debris was flown from Roswell Army Air Force Base to Fort Worth in Texas, where he was based. So he effectively pulled rank on Roswell. Um, and as a result of that, the fact that the debris moved rapidly from one place to another, uh, a lot of the conspiracies and a lot of the belief systems around the whole thing have been based since then. Walter Hort, and I've seen his name spelt both ways, which is why I've got the E in the um, in the brackets afterwards. Um, almost certainly, I mean, Walter Hort is normally spelt without the E. Uh, Walter Hort wrote the press release, basically. He's significant in two ways. First of all, he wrote the press release. Secondly, long after the other two were dead, if you see there that they died in the 1960s. In fact, if you look at some of the people in this case, we'll come to their deaths in a minute, but if you look at some of the people in this case, it's uh, Roswell, involvement in the Roswell incident is probably not good for your health. Um, but Walter Hort was alive until 2005 and was therefore available to the absolute army of professional and amateur investigators who came along in the 80s and 90s to uh, monetize this case and explore it and investigate it. Um, towards the end of it, it's a bit sad because what towards the end of it, when some of Walter Hort's testimony was uh, being questioned, he was he obviously had lost a lot of his uh, his awareness. So he's he, he's an um, ambivalent figure in the case. And then William Blanchard on the right is the colonel. Uh, he so he was effectively in command of the Roswell base. He didn't rank as high as Roger Ramey, so therefore he couldn't dispute that Roger Ramey wanted the debris flown to him. Um, but Walter uh, William Blanchard rather authorised the release of the um, the press release and managed the first response to the recovery of the debris. So consequently, his actions uh, are central to a lot of the arguments about what was going on. So the team believer argument would crudely be that these people realised very, very quickly that they'd got hold of something. Um, and therefore, the involvement of two high-ranking officers and the rapid removal of the debris from one place to another, yeah. Yeah. the fact that they've got like a UFO. Um, team sceptic would say, well, 
and we're reading more into this than we want to. And uh, they pick on people when they're young and they're small and everything else. You weren't very big, was you, really? When you were I'll wait till that's muted. You're very big, sir. There's some nasty fucking bastards about that. It's not. There's some nasty fucking. It's like Liverpool Park, here, isn't it? Yeah. Take this up. Is it fair? Yeah. There's one of me. You two disappeared. Okay, right. So, um, the. The, the team skeptics take on this is just that they, they just responded appropriately to something that they didn't quite understand. And we'll come on to why that might have been in a minute. Um, One moment, Neil. Let me just try and find out where, the, where this is happening. Can nobody else actually stop a bit? Hang on. They're the ones trying to fit into It's coming from Mark Wallace. I can't mute it. Is it? This is going to look great on the recording, isn't it? Am I imagining that or did it just go quiet? Right. So um, for the third time of asking on this one, then um, I've seen all sorts of discussions about things that are apparently sinister and significant up to and including the rapid death of these people. Um, I'm going to make a very cynical and simple point about this so we don't go down that blind alley. Um, there were a lot of heavy smokers in the United States Air Force around this period. And Ramey and Blanchard both died of heart problems. Uh, Blanchard actually quite almost literally dropped dead inside the Pentagon at the age of 50. Uh, but a lot of these guys were heavy smokers. So I don't think they're sudden, I don't think that the fact that they died relatively young or you know in high office or anything was any attempt to cover anything up. I just think it was the nature of the, of the beast. In fact, We'll come back to heavy smoking uh, later on, because I think it's got a relevance to this. Um, so, yeah, Christian's right. There was a long silence. And uh, funny enough, I just checked this out myself last year because I'd always believed this and I'd always talked about it. But um, in an article for Skeptic magazine, uh, Duke Gildenberg, basically <laughs> a Roswell Requiem, which was a bit premature 20 years ago because... There will never be a requiem for Roswell. It, it'll die a slow death if it dies a death at all. But uh, he said there for more than 30 years, no one anywhere cared about the incident at Roswell. No one. It wasn't part of the ufologist law, nor was it an issue for critics of the paranormal, nor was it part of science fiction or tabloid entertainment. It was a forgotten footnote, not because it was cleverly concealed, but because it was a lousy case. Yeah, well... Um, it clearly isn't a lousy case if you go and ring up somebody like Mufon these days. But uh, I gave a talk to uh, the Ghost Club in October 2022. And it was a thing about just a lifetime of paranormal obsession and stuff like that. But um, I'd always believed, and one thing I talked about that, that time, so apologies if you're in the audience, I don't want to repeat too much of this, but... I pointed out that if you're of a certain age, i.e. basically my age, then a lot of what was available to you as literature in the days before the Internet and before there was mass press coverage and stuff like that was um, very luridly written, not very well referenced, effectively tabloid style books, things like the work of Brad Steiger. And I'm not knocking these because they're number one without books like this most of the ufologists of you know who are anywhere between 50 and 70 in the uk probably wouldn't be involved so much um but secondly when you know they, they, these were quite exciting inspiring books if only because they made you believe that it was you know it was like an episode of star trek some of the things that were going on with ufos effectively um you didn't need science fiction if you were reading this stuff and I double checked this before I went and spoke to the Ghost Club. I read three of these books, which I've still got, and it's true. Roswell is nowhere. I mean, it, it's not. <laughs> Brad Steiger doesn't cover it. Um, and interestingly, there are 
UFO crash retrieval stories in this period. Uh, some crackers if you want to go and Google this, but this is a timeline that you'll find on the Wikipedia page of Roswell, actually. Um, <clears throat> so Roswell is blue. Um, on, on the pink side, you've got some other cases mentioned, some famous ones. Uh, so the Twin Falls recovery, for example, which I'm alluding to there, um, a cracking case. And very, very quickly after the coming of the flying saucers, if you're totally unfamiliar with ufology, the modern era of ufology, i.e. basically what we now celebrate as the, you know, the sort of the, the ETH side of it, the aliens visiting the Earth, pretty much kick-started itself on the 24th of June 1947 when a pilot called Kenneth Arnold had a sighting of airborne objects. This is the period in which we get the term flying saucer. So it's it's literally, it, you know, it, it's about a week away from um, the Twin Falls, Idaho sightings. There was an explosion on the back of the Kenneth Arnold case very, very quickly. Now, it's an interesting thing. The, the, the term flying saucer, what are, when I wrote my the, the last book on on UFOs on the the um, the one that was on the first slide, one of the few facts you can't get your hands on definitely is the name of the person, the exact name of the person who coined the term flying saucer. It was not Kenneth Arnold. Kenneth Arnold described the airborne objects he saw as moving like a saucer would if you skipped it across what skimmed it across water. So in other words, he thought he was looking at objects flying a bit like like you skim a stone or something like that. The person who actually coined the term flying saucer was a man called Bill Biquet, who was a stringer, i.e. basically a, a correspondent for a, a newspaper called the East Oregonian. Um, and all the online sources disagree about the spelling of his name and whether there's a Q in it or not, basically, whether it's... but. Um, the point I'm making is that very quickly after that story became a lurid tabloid story in the United States, crash retrievals almost immediately started, right? And the first significant one, tw Twin Falls in, in um, Idaho, was a hoax. Uh, you had two local teenagers, basically. Some of the first crash retrieval stories were absolute cracking hoaxes, and they're worth a Google if, if only to find out about the people behind them. Probably the first one that got real traction was the Aztec case, which apparently included 16 dead aliens. Um, <clears throat> but the, the two the two guys behind this were, to all intents and purposes, snake oil salesmen, basically. Um, I mean, <laughs> glorious con men. There's, you know, there's, sorry, but there's a, if they make the movie, Johnny Knoxville should play one of them. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the, the area we're in here so the little graphic on the right effectively um there were crash retrieval stories before the roswell case became big international news okay um the archetype of the story was established and i i, I was trying i didn't get time today to dig out the article that um i read years ago which i, I meant I've, I've spoken about briefly at one of the asap conferences um, one of the best of them is, is virtually not reported these days, but in 1956, the the kind of template of the crash retrieval story, i.e. we've got this incredible debris, we've got to get it behind lock and key and let only experts deal with it. This really happened in 1956. An unusual military operation took place. It wasn't particularly dangerous, but it was unusual to do with what the soldiers were actually asked to do. One bunch of soldiers were asked to guard the same cargo from Bremerhaven in Germany, where it arrived by train, all the way to Fort Knox in Texas, i.e. they literally stayed with it on the boat, uh, on the train, all the way to Fort Knox. And these soldiers were told that what they were guarding was, in inverted commas, the wings and engine of a flying saucer. Um, Jimmy Carter declassified the whole story in 1978 when there was no need for classification anymore at which point it was some of you'll be ahead of me on this anyway but it's 1956 what they were guarding were the hungarian crown jewels which had been taken out of budapest as the russians advanced so they spent the hungarian crown jewels spent a part of their life in fort knox in texas 
and actually Fort Knox is a daft place to take a crashed UFO anyway because it's a bullion depository but the significance of the story which I remember Martin Kottmeyer who's a leading skeptic in the UFO world writing about over 30 years ago the point is that there's a there's a template uh long long before Roswell became public knowledge became a kind of celebrated UFO case there is a template of crash a retrieval a crack military team doing exceptional things i.e behaving in a way with orders that are atypical of the way that you'd normally arrange a military team uh, and then the results of the whole thing being kept in maximum security conditions that template predates roswell by a long long time so these are the main bits this these are the kind of greatest hits of the history that bring it to public high public awareness <clears throat> in 1978 the national inquirer uh was the national inquirer was well underway in the 1970s on a on a project that involved making ufos and aliens a big part of its news feed and so just trawling the existing archive in the united states they came upon the roswell case and they wrote about it right the original walter hawk press release the, the Roswell Daily News story that I showed you on the slide earlier on was central to the way that the National Enquirer first reported this. Almost immediately, Jesse Marcel, who was the individual, the intelligence officer that you saw with the debris, came forward and said that actually that they'd got it right. The thing had gone quiet, but he, as an eyewitness, was there to tell them that he had retrieved debris from a, a flying saucer and the the evidence for this evidence again in inverted commas because um <clears throat> it's not evidence that was made public at the time but he was prepared to talk about it in the 1970s amongst other things the evidence was the exceptional properties of the material recovered now i'm not going to go back to the slide but i think there is virtually no disagreement about something i'm going to tell you here the photograph of Jesse Marcel that you saw earlier on, where he's crouching down and holding the debris, everybody, the sceptics, the believers, will all agree that he's not holding the stuff that was recovered at the Brazil Ranch. That was already in another place and was being shipped off to, to uh, General Ramey in Fort Worth. So they posed with a weather balloon, as in literally a mundane weather balloon. And the whole story, you know, when Jesse Marcel was, but when, when the Army Air Force said, oh, sorry, we got it wrong, nothing to see here. Uh, the weather balloon debris was just a normal weather balloon. This context to Jesse Marcel going to the National Enquirer, it didn't just happen by accident. The National Enquirer were big into UFOs at the time, and they had a $100,000 reward at the time for anybody who would bring proof of extraterrestrial life, i.e. proper UFO case to them. They never paid out on the hundred thousand pounds, but a number of people did come forward in the 1970s when this was on offer um, to claim it. And you're looking, I mean, this is a life changing sum of money in the United States in the 1970s. Um, you'd be a millionaire by today's standards. Um, so <clears throat> one or two people did come forward, including the guy with the moustache that you're looking at at the bottom there. That's Travis Walton. And if you've seen the Fire in the Sky movie, that's based on the story that Travis Walton told the National Enquirer. It's an interesting case because Travis Walton and uh, Travis Walton was part of a logging crew who were behind on a contract in Arizona. And according to their version of events, a UFO event occurred on their way home from out of the forest. Travis Walton was abducted and went missing for a number of days. Um, and th these exceptional circumstances were their argument about why they ended up defaulting on the logging contract. But they didn't they weren't penalized for this. There was a financial penalty. Um, and I mean, you know what I'm going to say next. So one school of thought is he was genuinely abducted. And to this day, Travis Walton does UFO conferences and stuff. He went to the National Enquirer to claim the hundred thousand pounds. He got five thousand hundred thousand dollars rather. He got five thousand dollars for the best story of the year. If you read this, the sceptical accounts, including that by Philip Klass, K-L-A-S-S, -S, if you're interested, who was a, a, an aviation journalist, an arch-UFO sceptic for many years. Um, Philip Klass went into 
print, and I'm assuming he did his due diligence on this, claiming that the reason that the National Enquirer didn't pay out the £100,000 is that when they put Travis Walton through a polygraph, the polygraph operator said it was the worst case of, you know, I mean, <laughs> the worst lying he'd ever seen. Uh, that That's actually mentioned in one of the Philip Class books. Um, so obviously there's that side of it. On the other hand, Travis Walton's take on this is that he genuinely was abducted. He was in absolutely no fit state to do anything properly when he had the first polygraph from the National Enquirer. And he's not surprised at those results himself. Um, either way, there was money in the right story. And if you think about this from the National Enquirer's point of view, whether they ever expected that somebody would come forward with conclusive proof or not, they were getting good stories at a knockdown price effectively because these stories have gone on to be the bedrock of particularly the extraterrestrial hypothesis version of um, ufology. So some of the ones that Christian was coming up with earlier on, um, Pascagoula incident and stuff like that, the National Enquirer was central to breaking in the United States as major stories. Um, secondly, if somebody had walked into the National Enquirer and in exchange for $100,000, had actually given them the best UFO story of all time, this would have been a world-changing event. Um, and if you paid a million a million dollars for such a story these days, it would be cheap. So, you know, there was method and there was method in their madness, shall we say, right? <clears throat> so central to Team Skeptic's claim is this. Um, this is contemporaneous. As I'm looking at it, I think part of uh, what I'm quoting on the left is, is being obscured by the little bar of, of us on the right there. But basically, Jesse Marcel said at the time, we spent a couple of hours on Monday afternoon on, on the Brazil ranch looking for any more parts of the weather device. So originally he'd said that. We found a few more patches of tin foil and rubber, right? <clears throat> he doesn't mention... Sheridan Cavett there, effectively he's talking about himself and Matt Brazel bringing the stuff in. So one argument would be Jesse Marcel went forward in the 1970s after the National Enquirer decided to break the case because there was money to be made. All right. And the evidence for that is that Jesse Marcel's accounts from the time don't say anything exotic and they're very specific about the materials, tinfoil and rubber. All right. Jesse Marcel's argument is that the whole thing was hushed up and he wasn't allowed to talk about it. So these are the team believer sides started to get going. The first, the book that took this effectively since after the National Enquirer got hold of Jesse Marcel, the next thing that happened was that he networked very quickly, partly with help from the National Enquirer. And one of the people that was brought in rapidly was a guy called Charles Burlitz, as in from the same family that did the famous travel guide. Now, he's, Charles Burlitz is not a significant figure in ufology other than co-author in the Roswell incident, but there are two things that brought him to the party very quickly. Number one, he understood books and book publishing. Number two, at the time, he was actually quite a hot author in the paranormal because his biggest paranormal bestseller at that time was a book on the Bermuda Triangle. And probably nobody in the 1970s did more to publicise and make popular the Bermuda Triangle than Charles Burlitt. So whilst he's sort of a marginal figure these days when Roswell is discussed, he's understandably a central figure then. Another one of the, the main witnesses to this is, um, i.e. people who've supported the Believer team over the years, is Jesse Marcel Jr., who is exactly what you think. He's Jesse Marcel's son. Um, and he has, well, he's dead now, but he was talking until he died uh, of childhood memories of, amongst other things, his dad showing him these exotic debris, taking, bringing a bit of the debris home and showing him this exotic debris. And he's been central to one belief about the Roswell debris for years, which is that it, it was um, almost like a magic metal material, that, that it, it was incredibly thin, had incredible strength. And you could bend it out of shape, at which point it would automatically regain its original shape with absolutely no evidence that it had been bent or creased or anything like that. So that it would just it would look pristine and it would just reform itself. Um, but the Roswell incident really takes off with the Roswell incident book. Charles Burlitz and Bill Moore are the co-authors of this and central to their claim and subsequent claims is that 
what came down on the Brazel Ranch was only part of a craft. Uh, it's not quite that simple, and we'll get to why it's more complicated in a minute. But the gist of it is that the Brazel Ranch debris were marginal to the case, that they were just a few bits of debris that were jettisoned for one catastrophic reason or another. The best guess in the Roswell Incident book by Burlitz and Moore is that lightning brought down an alien spacecraft and that on the plains of San Augustin, which is near the Brazil Ranch, but not that near the Brazil Ranch, the main craft, including bodies, came down. And since this particular book came out, one thing that's kept the case alive are eyewitnesses, crash site locations, investigations thereof. So Roswell has developed legs on that basis. One of the key eyewitnesses, one of the people who's quoted very early on in, in the Roswell incident book is a guy called Grady, in inverted commas, Barney Barnett. Uh, effectively, he's an archaeologist. He's got a team of students with him and they come upon the debris around the same time that the the Air Force are about to recover it. Um, but they're civilian eyewitnesses to the whole thing. Their story is mentioned in the Roswell incident book. And it just takes off. It just grows wings from there, basically. So within a couple of, well, but within, the 1990s is the kind of heyday for this. Let's just go there, right? Um, so Stanton Friedman, who you saw earlier on, co-authored a book called Crash at Corona. And central to his claim uh, is a, an eyewitness called Glenn Dennis. Now, we'll come on to Glenn Dennis again later on when we think about what Carl Flock was investigating, but... Glenn Dennis is the guy on the right and Glenn Dennis in this particular period when the case was becoming massively well known and was becoming there's some this coincides with an expansion in television channels VHS tape is at its height lots of private documentaries are being made these things are getting shown at UFO conferences there are more UFO conferences with pre-internet so if people want to find out about this stuff they literally have to go to Blockbuster, they have to buy the videos, or they have to turn up at the UFO conferences. So that's how the case is, is growing and expanding at this point. And people like Glenn Dennis are central to it. Glenn Dennis, I always found one of the more convincing eyewitnesses. So at, at the point at which the case is probably at its highest credibility, i.e. the sceptics haven't yet come in with the massive demolition job that they'll do later on on it. Glenn Dennis, his, his claim is quite simple. His story is that he was a mortician and he worked in a funeral home and the funeral home on the, the day of the Roswell crash recovery, the funeral home got a call, an unusual call from the Army Air Force Base because they were being asked for um, two things. They were being asked first of all about preserving bodies that had been exposed to the elements. And secondly, significant to Glenn Dennis's claim is they were asked to deliver a number of small caskets, i.e. basically coffins for children, um, which would be an unusual event. I mean, the the they were not used to delivering coffins for children to the military, right? There were occasions when the funeral home had dealings with the local air base because there had been accidents, but clearly these were accidents that occurred to adults. So Glenn Dennis personally in his testimony volunteered to deliver the caskets and he had a particular reason for doing this a particular personal interest because he was romantically involved with a nurse at the base called Naomi Self so his plan was to deliver the caskets uh, and then go and see his girlfriend who was because she was a nurse she was in the medical wing so he did that and he went the story he told is that he went to the medical wing and as was his wont at the time because it was all pretty you know, they knew him on the base, so people didn't tend to apprehend him. He just wandered in to, to find it, at, at which point he was rapidly uh, shepherded off the premises. She saw him. She was horrified. She told him to get out of there right away. Um, and the story he told was that subsequent to that, he and she had a drink in town. And she told him what had really been going on, that he'd, in wandering in there, he'd gone within feet of... Um, an autopsy being carried out on a dead alien, basically, and that the caskets were for the unfortunate crew of the crashed UFO. All of this is told in the Crush at Corona book by uh, Stan Friedman and Don, Don Berliner. 
And <clears throat> from the point at which Stan Friedman got involved in the case, Stan Friedman remained an absolute believer in the truth of these stories to the end of his life. Um, but in the 1990s, excuse me while I just have another drink, if you like, the best and the worst news about Roswell was both to do with its, its its high profile and the publicity it was getting at the time. So the situation I described to you there, because it's pre-internet, a lot of the new news about Roswell is either broken in regular newsstand magazines or subscription magazines. So, for example, UFO magazine in the UK, which was run by the Birdsell brothers, was regularly updating us on Roswell. Um, and if it's not that, it's broken at conferences by researchers. And these people are making money out of researching the case. So predictably, I guess, um, these people keep turning up eyewitnesses and new information. And on the one hand, it's great. They're digging away. They're finding people who are coming forward and telling them stories which corroborate other stories. So the notion that something of huge significance happened is almost accepted as a you know that nobody's questioning it right um the problem comes in the fact that some of these things begin to contradict each other and as they dig deeper and deeper they get very detailed stories so kevin randall and don schmidt who've been again central to the case for decades now they produced a book called ufo crash at roswell in 1991 uh, and uh, central to their claim is that a security cordon was set up on um a ranch there was a second crash site and they found multiple new witnesses who we haven't got time to go into here, but also the notion that the second crash site had a huge gouge in the in in the ground, i.e. that this was a this was not an idle lightning strike and a crash sort of had a, a, a craft had a controlled crash. This was a massive accident. OK, um, crash at Corona, which you've just seen by if, if you summarize the argument they had a slightly different take on it right um they combined all the eyewitness testimonies i.e these people that didn't taking a diversion here for a second if you were skeptical from the start one of the problems with the eyewitnesses was they were very very clear about all the amazing stuff they'd seen to do with crushed a crushed ufo and dead or possibly alive aliens but one of the one of the alarm bells, if you were sceptical about the eyewitnesses, was that they didn't spot each other. I mean, they'd, they'd come upon a huge, incredible event. If Just a basic here. If, if you find yourself caught up in a massive motorway accident or something like that, and all the traffic is stopped, people get out and talk to each other, right? Well, it's interesting that in the Roswell cases, they didn't. These people didn't see each other, so... Uh, Jim Ragsdale didn't see, well, you, you know, they, they just didn't see each other, basically. They didn't drop each other's names. They didn't describe each other. Crash at Corona largely solved that by working out a scenario in which there was multiple crash sites, effectively. There was more than one down crash, craft, okay? Um, which also dealt with the problem that some of the eyewitnesses saw live aliens. Some of them were absolutely certain that all the aliens they saw were dead. So that that's... That's where it was. And by 1994, there was a kind of universal theory. Uh, Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt did a second book very quickly after the first one. Um, as I've put on the third bullet point there, we're actually on version five of the story by now. So either you can look at it two ways. Four versions have led to version five because all the, the first four versions have brought the eyewitnesses out and therefore... Consequently, there's more detail. Alternatively, some of these are revisions. Um, there are things that have escalated in this tale by this point. Dwight Eisenhower has now witnessed the alien bodies, according to some of the witnesses, right? This book is a watershed for a number of reasons. First of all, because some of the, U the main UFO organizations in the country in the United States are now in disagreement about it. So the Center for UFO Studies, which is largely an academic institution in the in tribute to J. Allen Hynek, who was one of the greatest ufologists of all, 
it's always been much more bothered about peer review or something similar to that if you can get it um they are completely at odds with mufon which is the mutual ufo network which is a the biggest civilian organization in the united states about what they find credible and what they don't and another reason that this book is a watershed is that <clears throat> in uniting all the stories uh in the truth about roswell notably grady barnett i.e the archaeologist with his students who came upon the crashed craft they deal with the fact that grady barnett and the claims about him don't fit in with all the others the, this book deals with it by just ignoring him they don't explain why he's not there he just isn't there simple as um and one of the key witnesses here is a guy called frank kaufman so randall and schmidt talk a lot to a guy called frank kaufman frank kaufman frank kaufman's story is that he was effectively in the front line of the american military and as a result of what happened and where it happened, he was in the front line of the crash retrieval and cover up, basically. Um, and he's like Jesse Marcel. And his story is, I was sworn to secrecy, but I'm getting older and now I'm going to tell the truth. All right. <clears throat> but it did get a bit surreal. So here's a few. <laughs> here's a few things, too. I'm assuming you can all see the slide, by the way. I've got a bar across the bottom where so the, some of the, the words are disappearing and off to the right here, but don't worry, I, I know this stuff well enough. The gentleman on the top left here is Philip J. Corso. Philip J. Corso's book, The Day After Roswell, details a completely different story because he was a high-ranking military officer. The gist of his story is quite simple. In the aftermath of the Roswell case, there was reverse engineering of craft. There was all sorts of amazing top secret stuff that went on, which reads absolutely brilliantly. The book has sold something in the re region of a million and a half copies. Um, and central to, I mean, you, I'm sure I'm not surprised anybody here if you've not heard this story. Central to all of this, of course, is Philip J. Corso himself. So effectively, the day after Roswell purports to be an eyewitness account of what went on after the cover-up, who was involved, how the reverse engineering worked, what they discovered, what they couldn't discover. Fantastic story. But a word of caution. In 2001, when The Guardian presumed to come up with a list of the top 10 literary hoaxes of all time, um, they put the day after Roswell higher in the ranking than Howard Hughes' non-existent autobiography written by Clifford Irving which is basically a, an act of fraud from beginning to end as is the Hitler diaries in other words they thought the day after Roswell was a better literary hoax than those two they don't believe a word of it and it's not something that's widely discussed these days and certainly the alien autopsy movie the infamous alien autopsy movie that premiered in the UK in 1995 is another bit of this it's getting silly at, at the the conference i mentioned earlier on the uh, the ufo conference in pontefract one of the speakers there was uh, spirus malarkis and he, he spirus malarkis spirus Miliarchis, um again cutting a long story short about spirus spirus is one of the two special effects geniuses who faked the alien autopsy hoax that's what he was talking about at that conference right um but in 1995 phil mantle for whom i've got a lot of time so i'm not having to go at all phil mantle who's the guy behind flying disc press phil mantle was one of the first people to take the alien autopsy hoax seriously and actually um had a piece published on the front of the independent newspaper which started with the words dear ufo disbeliever so the alien autopsy hoax was an interesting little diversion the uh the, the video of it i mean quite a surreal moment for me actually because i was one of a bunch of researchers who saw it at the 1995 independent ufo network conference so it had been seen in private rooms before then but this was its first public airing at a conference a few days after its its first showings and just as you do, you know, I took my seat in the conference with everybody else. Um, I found myself sitting just like about as far away from the screen as I am now with Roy Hattersley. And I'm like, well, what the hell is he doing here? This is the deputy leader of the Labour Party. And he was quite happily talking to people and saying, well, I'm a journalist. This is the best story in town at the moment. This was all taking place in Sheffield, where he had a constituency. So, um and there was even um, Mike Farrell of um, the who played um, 
uh, BJ in MASH. He was the one who replaced Trapper John. Um, he presented, he, he was the host of a UFO documentary, live documentary in the mid 1990s in the United States, where amongst other things, people came forward with stories about what happened after Roswell and the alien that they'd kept alive in top secret and in the United, uh, you know, under cover of the United States government and how this alien liked strawberry ice cream. So some of this stuff just got quite surreal, but this is all spinning off Roswell. I mention that because that the fact that some of the stories that spun off the original Roswell case became quite bizarre, really opened the door, created a hunger for a level of scepticism that is covered in these four books. Let me take them left to right. Cal Korf's book, The Roswell UFO Crash, What They Don't Want You to Know, is written in the same accessible, easy to follow tabloid style of things like Crash at Corona. But it's a sceptical book. Effectively, it writes in the same style as the books about the crash that claim it's for real. And it, it sets out to demolish them. And it, it does the obvious thing. It says, well, um, this story doesn't tally with that story. If you look at the timeline, this doesn't work out. If you think about the crash sites it just it, it in a very accessible way applies skepticism let's go to the extreme right here ufo crush at roswell the genesis of a modern myth the book has three authors i'll presume to talk about one of them one of the three authors is a man called charles e moore who went on to be a very significant academic but in july 1947 june and july 1947 um, he was a graduate student and he was working on Project Mogul, which was a, uh, a top secret program in the United States. Effectively, they were using weather balloon technology, tying huge strings of weather balloons together to get a fantastic lift and then putting sensors underneath them. The aim of this Project Mogul was to spy on the Russians, literally to put sensors underneath these trains of balloons that would detect Russian nuclear crashes, and then they could retrieve, the Americans could retrieve their own balloon later on. I used to talk about this ages ago when I was talking about UFOs, and, um, you know, I'd sort of have to explain, well, you know, in the 1940s, balloon technology was quite useful for spying. I'd really like to thank the Chinese government for spying on the Americans this year with balloons, because <laughs> I don't need to labour that point anymore. This is 2023. Balloons still have their place. And it's interesting. There's two things to say about the uh, Charles Moore's take in the uh, UFO crash at Roswell. First of all, I would defy any casual ufologist to read that book. You So much of what Charles Moore has to say concerns the properties of neoprene balloons. It's more than any common citizen with no interest in balloons would ever need to know but he says a lot about neoprene balloons and the point he's making is that to him it's an open and shut case the roswell debris was a balloon launch number four balloon launch of project mogul uh which he was involved in and we'll come to that balloon in later on the Roswell report case closed was twice published by the american government 1994 and 1997 and effectively, it's Bill Clinton delivering on a promise to demystify and declassify UFO information, and specifically the Roswell case. Um, under his administration, files were opened, and one of the problems was that because of the compartmentalised security of the American military, some of these files had not been available to other people who'd looked but under the auspices of the Clinton administration, decades later, they had a, a good look around for what might explain the Roswell incident. And they came to the same conclusion as Charles E. Moore. It was a project mogul failure, i.e. it was a very complicated set of balloons, but it was it, effectively it was weather balloon technology, albeit attached to a top secret experiment to spy on the Russians. And specifically, number four, the fourth launch of, project, of the Project Mogul experiment was the cause of the Roswell debris. The book I'm leaving to last is this one, the second on the left here, uh, Roswell, Inconvenient Facts and the Will to Believe. 
So I've quoted to you from that book earlier on, i.e. the team sceptic thing, Carl Flock's argument, basically, that when you summarise all of this, um, you're looking at a case that is supported by people just shoving whatever random facts they can get to support their own argument. And crucially, and this is crucial to everything that Carl Flock has to say, there is so much evidence to the contrary that the people who want to keep this case alive just willfully ignore. And to give you some examples, let, let's just re briefly recap on this. The Fund for UFO Research never devoted more time or more money to any investigation than Roswell. And if you think about why they would do this, it's obvious. The purpose of the Fund for UFO Research was to gather as much money as possible, do the best critical investigations of the best UFO cases, and then throw them to the leading sceptics and say, we told you. So it was always likely that they would go to Roswell. It was always likely that when they went to Roswell, they would make a colossal effort to stand this thing up. And Carl Flock was their chosen person. Uh, he went into it expecting to find fantastic evidence. So he was demoralized. He was, you know, he he didn't go into it with a closed mind, but he went into it with a great deal of excitement because at the point at which he entered this in the mid 1990s, there were eyewitnesses, there was evidence of a cover up, there was everything that you might need to suggest that something of huge significance had actually happened. And to follow up on some stuff I said earlier on, so Glenn Dennis, apparently one of the most convincing witnesses, Glenn Dennis is the guy who had the romantic involvement with the nurse and chose to go and visit her after he delivered the coffins for the airbase. Uh, he'd named her. Her name was Naomi Self. So he probably, in naming her, didn't expect that somebody later on would have significant sums of money at his disposal and would have the time to go and find her. Digging around. So Glenn Dennis's story was that Naomi Self was unavailable because she'd been redeployed very quickly after the Roswell incident to somewhere else. And then not long after that, died in a plane crash. Well, Carl Flock went looking and looking in all the Carl Flock interviewed surviving nurses from the that era in the American military. Came to the conclusion that Naomi Self never existed. There was nobody, not only did Naomi Self not exist, there was nobody who actually fitted the profile of the career that, um, i.e. the nurse that died in the air crash shortly after Roswell, that Glenn Dennis had, had described. And if you don't read, sometimes I've talked about this in like in a public, you know, like in a room or whatever. Uh, and I've taken that book with me because if you never read it, one of the most obvious things that a point that Carl Flock makes, and to this day it's easy to prove. Um, if you open the flyleaf on the book, the beginning and the end of the book, there's a map, and it's a map of the area of Roswell. And the point of it is that Carl Flock on the map locates a number of different landing sites, I a crash sites rather. And the point he's making is that. <laughs> This is the crash site claimed by so-and-so. This is the crash site claimed by so-and-so. And they're clearly not in the same place. And not only that, but to kind of add insult to the injury that he's causing here, um, he has revisionist crash sites. Frank Kaufman, who's one of the key witnesses in the version five story, I trust you're all following this at this point, but you see it's labyrinthine. But Frank Kaufman, who was the frontline military guy who was involved in the secret operation, in the course of the investigation that Carl Flock conducts, Frank Kaufman signs three different affidavits. Clearly, number three contradicts number two, which contradicts number one. And one of the reasons, well, Frank Kaufman's take on this is that he's remembering new things and realising he's made mistakes. Uh, Carl Flock's take on it is that the original stories have crashed and burned because Carl Flock has investigated them to destruction. So consequently, the only way they can keep them alive is to decide that they forgot something significant but anyway roswell inconvenient facts and the will to believe is of all of these things probably the most comprehensive de demolition job and the context of this i.e it's the fund for ufo research looking to prove the case is also difficult to say the least um and the point i'd make about the crash sites before we move on 
it's it's just a basic but if you lined up every ufo documentary that's ever investigated roswell so you know ufo hunters have been there the sci-fi channel's been there and dug a trench and other people um roswell the first witness go and have a look and whatever um <clears throat> if you just lined all the documentaries up freeze framed them and photographed the freeze frames when they are at the crash site it is blatantly obvious that these films are not taken in the same place because the land the, the the profile of the land in the background does have a habit of changing and that's because as carl flock points out there are contradictory claims about the different crash sites not that any of this actually killed the roswell case so moving swiftly along to 75 years after the event 2022 the gift that keeps on giving basically um roswell spawned predictably some documentaries and there were two main main documentary series that came out of this to both both of which claimed some new angles on it so roswell the final verdict and roswell the first witness so the final verdict, the, the gist of the final verdict is that um, fa facial recognition technology, facial computer analytics of people being interviewed and talking were applied to it. The same computer analytics at that point that were being used in the front line of America's border force effectively. So there were computer programs which would analyze video which would apparently indicate to you that people were telling the truth in roswell the final verdict these programs were applied to interviews with key witnesses which would already been recorded obviously they got their hands on the old footage so in certain cases like in the case of jesse marcel and clearly jesse marcel died in the mid 1980s so they hadn't got him available anymore but they had got all the footage of him and came to the conclusion that these people were telling the truth, basically. Um, and it's great telling. I mean, when you see all the, you know, the when you see the thing actually played out on the screen, you've got the original witness talking, you've got the expert who uses the technology, and this is the same technology that's being rolled out on the front line to stop immigration and drug smuggling and stuff like that, illegal immigration and drug smuggling. Um, you know, and it, they, they make a good fist of it. I would, if you're sceptical, I would recommend that you go and look at the Skeptoid episode about the same technology, um, which, amongst other things, points out that the immigration people in the United States ditched it because its ability to spot uh, illegal immigrants or drug smugglers was no better than chance. So I mean, it didn't outperform humans. And again, I'm, I'm probably speaking to the converted here, but as somebody who's done quite a few pieces to camera and stuff like that over the years for either blathering about the paranormal or one or two other subjects. Um, one thing that they don't address in Roswell, the final verdict, is the circumstances in which you might do a piece to camera. But typically, they've got you sat in a chair with a camera and the interviewer, possibly the, if it's a low budget thing, the interviewer is also the producer, who is also the director, and they're stood behind their camera. And they ask you the same question three times and they've already run over it once anyway. So in that moment, to be honest, you're not thinking, is what I'm saying true? You're thinking, I just want to make this person happy because the second we're done with this, I get paid. Um, so Roswell, the final verdict, doesn't put the context of how the video clips were made there. Roswell, the first witness, is effectively, it's a look at Jesse Marcel, the life and work of Jesse Marcel. Uh, and he... <laughs> Excuse the cynicism here, but he's not the first witness, is he? I mean, Matt Brazel was the guy that discovered the debris field. Um, and other people, including the sheriff, had seen the debris before Jesse Marcel, Sheridan Cabot and Mac Brazel went to pick it up. Um, that said, Jesse Marcel is the guy that came forward. And without him, the case wouldn't be what it is. And they, they go to his house as was and try and get into it to see if there's anything there to be found. They discuss people who remember him and his kids and stuff like that. Um, so the one rock solid prediction, as I'm saying at the end there, this is the gift that keeps on giving. A bit like Marilyn Monroe, once all the key witnesses are dead, they'll still find some way of finding a new angle on it. Um, the four major sceptical books at the end of the 1990s that I had in the previous slide have not killed this case. 
And to give you some idea, look, these are both Rotten Tomatoes reviews of the same, literally the same video. There's a five star and a one star. OK. So that probably tells you all you need to know. This is on the uh, the final verdict one. Yeah. But. It's an innovative six part docuseries, if you like it. On the other hand, it's just rubbish <laughs> if you don't like it. Right. Um, these did not come from Team Skeptic or Team Believer. These just came from the general public responding to seeing this and choosing to post a review on Rotten Tomatoes. So this is where we are. Roswell is a live case still, okay? Um, there is still a working museum. There used to be two in Roswell. Roswell, to give you some context on this, the last census, Roswell had a population just a little bit less than 50,000. It's in the New Mexico desert. It was once more prosperous on the back of the military than it used to be. So somewhat like the Loch Ness Monster, it has a local resident mystery and it ma it maxes it out in terms of its ability to make money. Those tattoos, which you've seen earlier on in this presentation, for example, they're, you know, they there are festivals, there are live events, there are conferences. Roswell does pretty well out of it. That is a shot of wit uh, witness. That, that's a shot of people presenting at a conference. It's a, effectively a panel discussion at one of the conferences. Uh, the guy on the left-hand side, you may recognise, that is Nick Pope. Uh, just a thing to say about Nick Pope and Cal Korf, who wrote one of the sceptical books. Um, so... I'll mention this. I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but there's there is a one of the more interesting developments in ufology, which has not made the headlines in the way that the Pentagon hearings and the congressional discussions and stuff have made the headlines. Is this Cal Korf, who wrote the the most readable skeptical book on Roswell, um, has done something this year, in the middle of this year, that has got a lot of ufology talking he's using consumer fraud legislation in the united states to sue people and one of the people in his sites is nick pope and the gist of his argument here is this nick pope appears in videos and in conferences and he's usually billed as the guy that ran the ministry of defense ufo desk now i'm not close enough into this to, to have all the inside track i did i did about 20 years ago i've only met nick pope twice and the longest discussion i had with him by far was 20 years ago when we both appeared on the same tv show presented by michael cole the bouffant haired guy that used to be the uh, press guy for Mohammed al fayed and was a bbc correspondent for a number of years um nick pope has been a very bankable ufo expert but if you want to go and get some inside track on the back of it, I don't know who put the site up, but there is a Nick Pope Watch website. Very easy to find. What you'll find on Nick Pope Watch website or Nick Pope MOD, the facts Facebook page, is a combination of claims made on behalf of Nick Pope or claims he's made on his own behalf with what appear to be the facts from the MOD. The point being there's a gap between the two of them. Um, the indication of the documents is that Nick Pope and, and some of the people who know, I mean, I've seen Phil Mantle, who I mentioned earlier on, has po posted on the MOD, um, Nick Pope MOD, the Facts Facebook page, for example. Phil Mantle was involved in UFO research for so long that he was swapping correspondence with the UFO desk at the Ministry of Defence. Therefore, he would purport to know, number one, that the Ministry of Defence never had a UFO desk, that DSA, the Defence Secretariat 2A branch, basically, uh, dealt with low flying complaints and therefore by default dealt with some unexplained objects. And that was where you sent your inquiries. And he corresponded with Nick Pope. And therefore, some of the documents on there have Nick Pope's signature next to a grade that indicates that he wasn't running anything. I don't know where the hell this is going to end. But the point I'm making relevant to Roswell is this, that... A lot of people continue to do very well out of the case. They research it. They present evidence. Um, some of these people probably are doing well, but 
if you like, Carl Korff and one or two other people have thought the only way to get any serious, credible, critical investigation into this is occasionally to call some of these people into account. I have no idea where this is going to end. It'd be fair to say, I mean, I was interviewed about Nick Pope for a, um, by a guy called Francisco Garcia, who did an article in the Financial Times magazine about him. So it's clearly getting some traction in the serious press that ufology's got uh, developed this kind of real infighting thing about itself at the moment. I don't know where the hell it's going to end, but um, it'll be an interesting development. And it may well have a bearing on the Roswell case because some of the people in Calco's firing line are the people that he finds most annoying because he thinks they're inflating themselves and misrepresenting the case. All right. Um, so 2023, what have we got left to know? Well, there may be a natural selection of experts. In other words, some people may get taken out of the game. Cal Corf may succeed in doing that. He may succeed in undermining the claims of some people by using consumer fraud legislation against them because it's not just Nick Pope he's after. Um, some of the that said some people seem to survive this quite well randall and schmidt who wrote two books together and this is don schmidt ufo researcher um you know what I, I can't remember which documentary it was i think it was ufos declassified that one's from but he's literally at the landing site the landing site in roswell which doesn't look much like the landing site that ufo hunters went to so it's clearly a different backdrop um but the point is, Randall and Schmidt fell out big time because uh, in 1995, just after their version five book, um, basically Randall discovered that Schmidt was not any of the qualifications that he claimed to have. Uh, now, that said, it, it hasn't stopped Don Schmidt appearing on TV and being a leading expert there. So we don't know. I, th I think it quite likely um, that... Um, some of the people who've been central to this may in the next few years one way or the other disappear from the case the the, the attrition rate amongst ufologists leading ufologists is not you know it, it, it's a bit more alarming than you think bill moore who co-wrote the roswell incident book with charles burlitz for example um if you google the end of his ufology career uh, the mj12 documents were one of his big revelations but um, because he kind of worked on both sides of the fence, in the end, it totally undermined his credibility and he's nothing to do with the business anymore. So I think, you know, that's a possibility. Also, just to say that there's a problem here in that all these documentaries have to find something new. Typically, what makes good TV is people actually turn up on the various places and go investigate it. So they may turn something up which would be a big revelation. Alternatively, they might end up destroying things. And we'll come to how you might set out in search of evidence and end up destroying the case in a minute. But things that we've still got to find out. So if you're a team believer, whilst the case has been rocked by big revelations and scepticism or whatever, it's not been... It's not being destroyed, number one, because it still makes great TV. It still makes great media material. It therefore draws in new people the whole time. And a lot, if you were just being completely cynical about this, then one of the things that happens is that the new audiences are not made aware of things like Carl Flock's book because the likes of UFO hunters wouldn't think to mention it. But central to Team Believer is that there, there's a, a massive cover-up and the current hearings in camera publicly in the United States are based on this notion of cover up crash retrieval, reverse engineering, and the most recent case where David Grush came forward and talked about what he'd been told. I mean, you know, we're talking about people with serious security clearances here and they're being told these stories and they believe them. Um, now on the one hand, you could say, well, they're just falling for the same old rubbish. On the other hand, these people are paid to be critical thinkers. And one of the things that's convincing them is the sincerity of the testimony that's being thrown their way. So David Grush didn't claim to have seen anything up close. He just claimed to have heard a lot of things. Um, so there are loads and loads of claims that there are secrets hidden in the United States in somewhere. They're hidden, you know, places like Wright-Patterson Air Force Base or Area 51 these days, 
or the secrets are buried deep in the Pentagon. It is possible that something will come forward and because it's not like we're, you know, we're not sure the claims in this area. And there is certainly a change in the political climate at the moment. So these, for better or worse, these public hearings are gathering worldwide news attention. Um, and the kind of people testifying and the kind of people coming forward to make claims are of a, a, a level of credibility and security clearance that we haven't seen previously. It may be that some secrets about the Roswell case are buried in there and um, Team Believer are hanging on to that. Their take on it is that despite all the sceptical claims, the fundamental momentum of this is that there have been so many eyewitnesses, there's so much evidence, it can't all be accidental, okay? From Team Skeptic, <clears throat> so number one, Apologies for the moth swearing, but does anybody actually see that in balloon there, right? Let's go back to central to the sceptical claim, Charles E. Moore, who's the expert on neoprene balloons and was working on Project Mogul, and Carl Flock. Both of their books basically say the same thing, albeit with a lot of other things thrown in. But the gist of it is Project Mogul was a secret. You're looking at a picture of Project Mogul there. It was not normal weather balloon activity, right? Um, the Project Mogul balloon was about 657 feet high. So that is some serious balloon technology. And the gist of it was get a load of weather balloons, link them together with very strong links. Collectively, their lift will be such that they can get up to the jet stream, at which point they can access it. And it's not that's not so ridiculous. The Chinese are spying on the Americans by balloon these days, right? If you read the, the book co-authored by Charles E. Moore, what is amazing about Project Mogul is how much it did achieve. So the idea was when they needed to spy on the Soviets in the wake of the Second World War, that a number of ideas were on the table altogether. Number one, let's develop an air, let's develop a plane that can spy on them. Number two, let's use the balloons. Project Mogul started very unpromisingly. The first two launches on the eastern seaboard were not quite catastrophic, but not exactly impressive. They chose to go and experiment in the conditions they would find in the New Mexico desert. Launches three and four and beyond that took them a lot further. But the gist of it is launch four, which went up on the 4th of June 1947. The sceptical case of it is... Uh, that that was actually what's now understood as the Roswell Daybreak. But where Project Mogul ended was that by the end of it, they'd managed to launch balloons in the United States. And among the final launches in the experimental series, one balloon got as far as Tunisia, another one came down in Scandinavia. So they'd mastered a lot of it. And the only reason that Project Mogul was discontinued was that the U-2 spy plane technology got there first. It was more reliable. You could put a pilot in that and it could overfly Russia. So they didn't need Project Mogul. But the uh, the progress they made was incredible. And the anyone seeing that green balloon line here, let's just go for this for a second. There is a lot of doubt about where the actual landing site with the recovered bodies was. The one location that to within a few yards is widely understood at Roswell is the debris field. The location on the Brazil Ranch of the debris field is most people when they take a TV camera there are in the same place and everybody knows where it is more or less. I mean, it was never marked out, but within reason, they're all where Mac Brazel found the original debris. So the team skeptic side of it would raise two questions. Number one, if the recovery by Mac Brazel, Sheridan Cavett and Jesse Marcel was not the debris of Project Mogul's number four launch. Where the hell is that balloon? Because there's been so much overflying, TV filming and whatever in the area. If it wasn't recovered, you'd think they'd have spotted something. And not only that, but one of the um, one of the more telling moments in the uh, Roswell, the first witness series involves an excavation and it involves a metal detection and then ground penetrating radar 
applied to the site of the debris field and the Brazil Ranch. And the interesting thing is that they're obviously looking for any remote, any debris that might be left from a crashed UFO. The metal detector turns up nothing. The ground penetrating radar turns up a sizable random shaped chunk of something under the ground. Uh, and in an interview, like a Zoom interview with an expert at that point, um, the point that the point is made with it that um if they dig it up the expert believes they're going to find a chunk of neoprene balloon i.e it's clearly not metal but it's not it, it's of a size and shape that it doesn't appear to be any natural object um now that hasn't been dug up as far as i'm aware but that might be a chunk of the original balloon other things that might happen well um <clears throat> the winning the war of attrition by default comment there both sides believe this the skeptical side and the pro et side pretty much believe that if they just keep on going the other side will eventually just fall apart that may happen uh the other thing that may happen uh this case may go the way some, like the loch ness monster or whatever where it will just fail to come up with the telling piece of evidence and the truth is that it'll not disappear but the world may move on somewhere else and it's interesting here that um at the moment one of the more exciting developments in the search for extraterrestrial life again if you want to google this k218b the james webb space telescope has found an exoplanet that is about three times the size of earth and apparently covered in water and it appears to have a biosignature i.e there is some circumstantial evidence that we're looking at a planet that is giving off gases in its atmosphere that indicate there's life there um now if that happens <laughs> it may well be that a lot of people are interested in extraterrestrial life and evidence thereof who don't have that many spare hours in the week will graduate to the james webb space telescope and revelations there and get progressively less interested in roswell it might die a quiet death okay run almost over on that then okay thank you very much for listening i'm conscious that there are there's european football on it's not been a bad day for celebrity deaths so you know the news is quite interesting and on top of that there's every other distraction so the fact that there are 55 of you online i think you know i'm pleased to know that there are some intellectuals left on earth that are interested in the paranormal right if you're still there which i think takes us to this bit okay I've ranted enough about that. I'd be interested in any question and I'd be interested in how many people didn't know some of what I said, because the original point still stands really that um, I was conscious that that ASAP seemed to be interested in more ufology. I thought if I went route one to the biggest case on earth, uh, if 20 of you say, well, thank you very much, but I knew all of that, then we maybe need more eclectic ufology in ASAP. If I told you things you don't know, that might be useful to know as well, okay? I am gonna shut up and take some questions.